Good evening and welcome to this special edition of The 7 on 8. Tonight, our entire show dedicated to a deadly problem with tough ethical questions and no easy answers. A big jump in cases of alcohol-induced liver disease driven by the stress and isolation of COVID-19. In many cases, only a transplant can save lives. Target 8 investigator Susan Samples begins tonight with a Kent County family in the middle of a frenzied search for options to give a dad of two little girls a chance to see them grow up. Ian? Ian? Okay, we've got people here. Ian? Can you look out? Ian? How are you doing? He was walking around talking two days ago, so this is how quickly it's deteriorating. Yes, I want some hope. I just want a chance. You know, I want him to be there for his kids. Kim Burstenberger knew that her son drank too much, but not that he was up to a fifth of whiskey or vodka a day. With COVID, I think he just drank a lot more. But Gerstenberger says her son had a good job pre-COVID, an apartment, friends, and a passion for politics. On election day, Ian organized like 17 people to go vote. Above all, though, Ian Duff cherishes the two young daughters he shares with his ex-girlfriend. My birthday is tomorrow, and all I want for my birthday is for my dad to be better. He's got a life, that's the thing. It's not like he's just nobody, you know, doesn't have any hope, doesn't have a life, he does. He also has a sister who shares his blood type and was ready and willing to donate part of her liver to him. She said she'd do it if she could. That's the first thing she said. She said, I can't live without my brother. I'm just angry that they won't let me, you know, give him this gift and lengthen his life. He's 37. He's got two little kids. So I'm just watching him die. It's often been felt that there's like a moral problem with transplanting people who are actively drinking. Used to be, patients had to have two years sobriety for Michigan Medicaid to cover a liver transplant. But after the state lost a court challenge in the late 80s, that two-year requirement dropped to six months. But even that's a death sentence for patients with end-stage liver failure who may have just weeks to live. And then I think, by and large, people say six months is not, like, that's, that's just like kind of an arbitrary number. University of Michigan's Dr. Elliot Tapper points to research in recent years, first in Europe, then America, that shows transplant outcomes are just as good for recipients who weren't sober pre-transplant as for those who were. And so now we recognize that like medically, you can get the same great outcome. But other studies show patients with fewer than six months sobriety are more likely to return to high-risk drinking post-transplant. And the issue is the demand and supply of the organ. University of Chicago's Dr. Angina Pillai notes the wait list for livers. When someone gets an organ, someone else doesn't, right? Right now in Michigan, 233 people need livers. Nationwide, three to four die every day while waiting. So you're taking a precious organ that is somewhat scarce. They just see how yellow he is. His feet are swollen. Ian Duff's family isn't giving up. Yeah, because there's any time, because there's just not much time I can tell. I, I'm watching him fade. He's at his mom's house under hospice care after a trip to Cleveland Clinic for a transplant evaluation. He needs a liver immediately because he's going to die. And I was hoping they'd waive the rules, but they said no. Duff's family said he was rejected because of his alcoholism. But Cleveland Clinic denied that, telling Target 8 later Duff was too medically unstable for evaluation. But then, on this call with the University of Michigan Transplant Center, a glimmer of hope. All right, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. They said they don't, they don't do this six months. They, it's an individual case basis, and they don't adhere to that. He said, it sounds like he's a possible candidate. 
I don't know to be happy or scared. So, I mean, I don't know, but it's a chance, you know, it's a chance. I just don't. When we come back, it was that fast. She was jogging with her dog the week before. And they just basically told us, you have no hope. Binge drinking has gone up. In that demographic, the young people, it's worse now than it ever was before. She was 25 years old, 25. Three young women, all diagnosed with alcohol-induced liver failure, all denied transplants, at least initially. They say her liver is failing, and there's nothing that can be done. I just threw myself on her, begged her and begged her and begged her to fight. She just brought a lot of joy. She would rather serve other people. She was a very kind person. The athlete and dog lover was 25 when she was diagnosed with alcoholic liver failure in late 2019 at Detroit's Henry Ford Hospital. She'd felt like she had the flu and her belly was swollen, signs of alcoholic hepatitis. It's a death sentence. Like so many teens, Tracy Hart's daughter first tasted alcohol at high school parties, but her genes put her at risk for alcoholism. She grew up in an alcoholic house. That wasn't easy. She didn't think she was going to die at 25 years old from something she had watched other people do her whole life. It was after Brianna was sexually assaulted at 23, her mom says, that her drinking accelerated to at least a pint, often a fifth of vodka a day. It was always in a, a Gatorade or a juice. Brianna did manage to quit drinking for several months at one point, but relapsed. And a doctor told her to stop drinking in the months before her liver failed. You know, yeah, you should stop drinking, but they didn't say you're about to die. When Brianna was facing death in the hospital, she committed to sobriety for life. But Hart says Henry Ford declined the transplant, and the health system later told Target 8 it has a responsibility to follow generally accepted transplant standards. Those standards often require six months sobriety pre-transplant. The liver transplant team never evaluated her, came in, told her she was gonna die. Hart wouldn't back down, and after six weeks of red tape wrangling with Michigan Medicaid, Brianna was flown from Henry Ford to California for a transplant evaluation. I was on the phone some days, 13 hours a day. A San Diego program agreed to put Brianna on the liver wait list, but then during a procedure to drain her abdomen, Hart says doctors nicked an artery that was enlarged in part, Hart says, because it took months to find a program that would take her daughter. Brianna's favorite movie was Lion King. And when I had to pull the plug on her, I played the Lion King soundtrack behind her because I didn't want her to be scared. I wanted her to be happy. And it's just, she was such a little kid at heart. Chelsea was a smart girl. She was athletic, she was beautiful. Terry Osterley Klein thinks it was jealousy that made her daughter the target of high school bullies in Peoria, Illinois. And when a gang of girls beat her up in front of a crowd junior year. Unfortunately, after the attack, we had to pull her out. She could not go back to school. And she was good in sports. She could have had a basketball scholarship. So she had to give up that too. And that's right when she started drinking. But looking back, she was very good at hiding it. Like Brianna, Chelsea was already at higher risk because of addiction in her family. And by her early 20s, most days, she was drinking a pint of vodka. Putting it in Gatorade is what we later learned. At 24, Chelsea was diagnosed with alcohol-induced liver failure after she got sick with what initially felt like the flu. It would take a new liver to save her. 
I looked over and she just was, tears were just strolling down her face. And that, she said, I just don't think I'm gonna make it, Mom. <laughs> Osterly Klein managed to get her daughter transferred to a hospital that does liver transplants, Northwestern University Medical Center in Chicago. She's young, she deserves to live. I mean, Chelsea had said over and over, I, I never want to drink again, ever. But Chelsea had tried to quit before, went to rehab at 19, then relapsed. Osterly Klein says a doctor did tell Chelsea to stop drinking weeks before her liver failed but just sent her home with anti-anxiety meds and vitamins. Every time she would stop, she would get sick. But when you're that addicted, you cannot just stop on your own. Osterly Klein says Northwestern denied Chelsea a transplant. You're looking out over the city of Chicago and I'm just feeling like, how can everybody just go about their life? My daughter's dying up here. A month and a half after her diagnosis, Chelsea developed an infection, and Northwestern doctors said there was nothing more they could do. I just could not bear to see her in pain. I just thought if she is hurting, I've got to stop this. And that was it. The machines were shut off, and I think, you know, that sound of silence is the worst, just the absolute worst. In the years since her daughter's 2013 death, Osterly Klein has honored her by helping other families and pushing for change. I think some doctors just think you, you did this to yourself and we're not going to give you a second chance at life. But that's beginning to change, in part because new treatments for hepatitis C have reduced the need for transplants in those cases. So more programs are considering critical patients with active alcoholism for transplants. But patients must commit to sobriety and have a support system. And if they have a history of repeated disregard for their health, they'll probably be rejected. We got the, the call. She said, uh, just want to let you know I'm going to the emergency room. Dwayne Nelson says his 30-year-old daughter, Angie Schmidt, had no idea several years of near daily beers and Jägermeister shots were killing her liver. She'd felt fine at her wedding just three months before her diagnosis of alcoholic cirrhosis, discovered when a minor scab wouldn't stop bleeding. So from you know, a bleeding scab to liver failure was... A shock. It was 2018, and the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Angie lived in Nebraska, had denied her a life saving transplant because she didn't have six months sobriety. But they weren't going to be able to do anything for her, and she was going to die. That's when Angie's sister found the Selkirk Liver Society online, run by a Canadian woman, Deborah Selkirk, whose husband died after being rejected for transplant due to alcoholism. Selkirk had compiled a list of programs in the U.S. willing to waive the six-month rule. Called the office of the doctor in Chicago, and just by God's grace, he picked up the phone. Didn't get a voicemail. Didn't get a secretary, got him. The man who answered his own office phone, Dr. John Fung, chief of transplant surgery at University of Chicago. He said, uh, if you can get her here, we'll look at her. If she qualifies, we'll get her on the list. We'll worry about insurance later. That same day, a medical flight delivered Angie to the University of Chicago Medical Center, where she was evaluated and placed on the wait list. Then they came back uh, an hour or two later and said, we have two offers. One of the livers was a perfect match in perfect condition. So they said tomorrow morning, she goes into surgery. What do you think of Dr. Fung? As far as I can tell, he's a genius. He knows what he's doing, and he knows what the right thing to do is. I can't say enough good things about him. I don't see my dad cry. Like, that's my dad. And this is Angie Schmidt, now three plus years out from that transplant with not a drop of alcohol since. I fought so hard to live that I'm not willing to touch that again, ever. That six-month policy, it's just not fair. I think the worst part for me 
was knowing that they could do something to save me, but because of alcohol, they chose not to. I wasn't worth saving, is what I felt like. And that is probably the worst feeling ever, is being told you're not worth it. I have a son that's uh, 37, needs to be transported to U of M. When we come back, Ian Duff's last chance. Thanks for staying with us. Many places require six months of sobriety before they'll do liver transplants for alcohol-related liver patients. But increasingly, those coming in do not have six months. That's the case for 37-year-old Ian Duff, who we told you about earlier. Target 8's Susan Samples picks up his story. His family has found a place that may do the transplant, but is it already too late? He said, make sure you take care of my kids. It just shouldn't be like this. The eight-year-old doesn't want to leave. She wants to stay with them. I uh, lost a son 13 years ago. I don't want to bury two children. When Ian Duff's older brother died by suicide in 2007, Ian dulled the pain with alcohol. And when he was facing death himself with liver failure... He said, I did this to myself. And he said, it's a shitty way to die. He said, but, you know, I did it to myself. He had tried to get sober, tried several rehab programs in the last year. Now, though his sister was ready to donate part of her liver to him, he was running out of time, just days or even hours from death. He needs a liver immediately because he's going to die. Then, a potential lifeline, a call with the University of Michigan. They said they don't, they don't do this six months. It was the first transplant center that said it didn't require six months sobriety. So they said to get him here there today. Ian's mom and stepdad just had to get him to Ann Arbor. I have a son that's uh, 37, needs to be transported to U of M. Kim Gerstenberger called 911 for an ambulance. Yes, he's, he's in liver failure. I need to get him there today, so this is where I'm at. The ambulance company scrambled to find a team that could make the trip. She found a crew. They get to work at 1700, which is 5 o'clock. I am packing so I can go to U of M and stay as long as I need to. I don't want him to die like on the way there because it's not a sure thing. We're here. We're here. This is Ian. He's kind of having trouble coughing, so I don't know if he can suction. His sister's a donor, and um, hopefully, if it's not too late, they'll give him a liver. I know what we are. I gotta get some vitals on you, my dear. It's a choice no parent should have to make. U of M offers a chance at life, but Ian might die on the way there. We can run him out there as quickly as possible and still not make it. I know. So, you know, that versus him here with you. He thought he was just going to die. I know. And we think that he still might have, have a, a chance. chance. Well, this is his shot. I know. It had taken Ian Duff's family a dozen days to find a program that would evaluate him for transplant. They didn't realize that was even possible. Some places do liver transplants for acute alcoholics. Nobody told me that. They had to have known. Time to say goodbye to the Ian. Ian made it to the University of Michigan, but doctors said his heart was too weak to withstand a transplant. Two days after he arrived at U of M, he died there, his mom at his bedside. It was hard, you know, because I don't want my child's death to be in vain, I guess. You know, because if my child had to die, I would like it to be for something, you know, because otherwise it just hurts too much. If you're seeking help for yourself or a loved one, you'll find resources, links, and detailed statistics inside Susan's story at woodtv.com. Thank you for watching tonight.